Good evening. My name is Bill Purcell, and I'm the director of the Institute of Politics. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you here tonight to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, one of the singular initiatives of the Harvard Kennedy School is acting in time. And to that end, the Institute of Politics and this whole school work very hard to make sure that we bring to the people and, uh, the, of this school and of this university and of this community the issues, the topics, and the presenters which meet that very special criteria. And there is no better example than our event tonight. The title of this event is Health Reform in an Era of Pandemics, Implications for Health Sec Security. And to introduce our moderator, is Mary Jo Bain. I'm sorry to introduce our presenter. Actually, we've just had a change of moderators, and I will be the moderator. Uh, in this case this evening, however, our uh, introducer is Mary Jo Bain, our academic dean. She is also the Thornton Bradshaw Professor of Public Policy and Management here at the Harvard Kennedy School. From 1993 to 1996, she was Assistant Secretary for Children and Families at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. From 1992 to 1993, she was Commissioner of the New York State Department of Social Services. Prior to her government service, uh, she was here at the Kennedy School, Director of the Malcolm Weiner Center for Social Policy. From the Peace Corps to academics, to state government, to federal government, and back here to the Harvard Kennedy School, our moderator, uh, is a model for a life of public service. Please join me in welcoming Mary Jo Payne. It is my good fortune that uh, Dean Elwood is out of town tonight because he would never have let me do this if he were here. I am delighted to be able to welcome Dean Julio Frank to the John F. Uh, John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum and to the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, dean Frank is indeed dean uh, of the Harvard School of Public Health. He is also the Angelopoulos Professor of Public Health and International Development, both at the Harvard School of Public Health and here at the Kennedy School. So he is a member of our faculty about which we are delighted. Dean Frank is an eminent authority on global health who served as the Minister of Health of Mexico from 2000 to 2006. He pursued an ambitious agenda in Mexico to reform the nation's health system with an emphasis on redressing health insecurity and inequality. He's perhaps best known for his work in introducing a program of comprehensive national health insurance, remember that, uh, known as uh, Seguro Popular, which expanded access to health care for tens of millions of people. Dr. Frank was the founding director of the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico, one of the leading institutions of health education and research in the developing world. In 1998, Dr. Frank joined the World Health Organization as director uh, in charge of evidence and information for policy, remember that too. Uh, WHO's first ever unit explicitly charged with developing a scientific foundation for health policy to achieve better outcomes. Most recently, he served as a senior fellow in the Global Health Program of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and as president of the Carso Health Institute in Mexico City. He is chair of the board of the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington. Dr. Frank is indeed a real doctor holding a medical degree from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, as well as three advanced degrees from the University of Michigan, Master in Public Health, Master of Arts in Sociology, and a PhD in Medical Organization and Sociology. In addition to his scholarly works, he has articles, he has books, uh, and he has uh, written, I, uh, this, this uh, bio says, two best-selling novels for youngsters, explaining the functions of the human body. His topic tonight with us is health reform in an era of pandemics, implications for health security. Dr. Frank, I think, will help place the debates that we are having in this country in the larger context of global health crises and global health issues. And so we are delighted to welcome Dean Frank to the forum and to this audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good evening to everyone. 
It is a great honor for me to participate in the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, uh, which really represents the premier place for debating the most critical issues of our times. I would like to start by thanking my esteemed colleague, Dean David Elwood, as well as Mary Jo Bain, Bill Purcell, and Noelia Rodriguez for the invitation to address this distinguished audience. I am grateful to the Malcolm Wiener Center for Social Policy and the HKS Health Policy Professional Interest Council for co-sponsoring this event. The world is experiencing one of the most tense and intense health transformations in history. During the past few years, health matters have stopped being the exclusive concern of domain experts. And instead, health has come to occupy a central place in the most pressing dimensions of the global agenda. Economic development, national security, democratic governance, and human rights. Today, I will illustrate these trends by examining the impact of the H1N1 pandemic on global security. This pandemic is clearly showing us that in health matters, the world has become a single neighborhood and that the consequences of actions that are happening far away show up literally at our doorsteps. But we need to place this awareness in a broader context, not the least because the current pandemic interestingly coincides in time with an intense debate on healthcare reform in this country and also with the deepest global recession in decades. I will argue that a comprehensive concept of health security can help to better understand and meet the challenges posed by this unique moment in history. Let me start with the good news. It is encouraging to acknowledge that during the first wave of the pandemic, the global health community has gathered enough information and experience from different parts of the world to confront the second wave with a reasonable degree of confidence. The development of this contingency, however, has had its share of surprises and a sense of uneasiness still haunts the planet. Since at least 2005, the world has been aware of the imminent danger of an influenza pandemic, but we didn't know when and where it would start, and we knew practically nothing about the type of virus that would be involved. We were dealing with an expected but unknown event. As I argued in a New York Times op-ed published shortly after the pandemic began, considering the complexities of dealing with the first occurrence of a novel threat, the initial response was quite competent, although certainly not perfect. Now that the Northern Hemisphere is moving into its flu season, percep perceptions and expectations have changed. The accumulation of knowledge about the H1N1 virus means that we are now facing an expected and known event. And this changes public expectations. The population is aware that health authorities can limit the dissemination of the infection through the use of the new vaccine and other public health measures, and that health services have at their disposal a reasonable arsenal of clinical weapons to treat cases. In a matter of months, we have moved from an environment of high public attention, low scientific certainty, and low social exigency to an environment of still high public attention, but now with less scientific uncertainty and consequently higher social exigency. During the second wave of the pandemic, the most urgent burden of health services is likely to be in the increased number of patients with respiratory, respiratory failure requiring intensive care. This demand could overwhelm intensive care units and disrupt the provision of hospital care for other diseases. Globally, the most complex challenge will be to secure access to the H1N1 vaccine for all in need throughout the world. More damaging than the pandemic itself could be a situation where the wealthy countries have a sufficient supply of the vaccine while the rest of the world watches in impotence and resentment as populations suffer. I can imagine few situations that would be more damaging to global solidarity and stability. SARS, bioterrorism, and now influenza are largely responsible for the growing attention and resources being directed towards global health. A recent study finds that development assistance for health has tripled from about $7 billion in the year 2000 to more than $21 billion in 2007. I, I think there are very few examples where in a period of seven years 
international aid for a particular topic has, has tripled. And this is, has to do with what I mentioned before. Health is being increasingly recognized as an element of global security, sustainable economic growth, democratic governance, and the promotion of human rights. In foreign policy terms, health has moved from the realm of low politics to, the, to that of high politics. Its relevance to security concerns has become so obvious that the term health security has recently gained currency. There is no doubt that investments in epidemiological surveillance and response contribute to the control of threats facing nation states, such as pandemics and biological warfare. This is you know, a, a dimension of national security that most people are not aware of, but in fact, in this country and in many countries throughout the world, there is literally an army of epidemiologists 24 hours a day, seven days a week, actually guarding the borders, not against human uh, enemies, but against microbiological threats and other kinds of threats. However, in addition to this aspect, investment in the protection of individuals from threats that endanger their health would also make our world a safer place. This idea lies at the core of the concept of human security, which according to the United Nations Development Program includes economic, food, health, environmental, personal, community, and political security. Coined by the Palme Commission in 1982, the concept of human security has evolved through several phases to reach its, its present comprehensive content. A culminating point came with the work of the Commission on, health Sec on Human Security, established in 2001, which was co-chaired by Madame Sadako Ogata and our own Nobel laureate, Amartya Sen. According to the report of this commission, human security, and I quote, means protecting people from critical and pervasive threats and situations, building on their strengths and aspirations. It also means creating systems that give people the building blocks of survival, dignity, and livelihood, end of quote. The notion of health security brings these two strands together by identifying the risk the risks that challenge the health of individuals and societies. Until recently, this term had been identified with the protection against external threats, whether a microbe or a chemical agent. I believe that we should move beyond this limited usage <clears throat> and propose a comprehensive definition, which may serve to anchor our efforts to improve global public health. Let me therefore suggest three dimensions of health security. The first dimension can be called epidemiological security, and it comprises the more traditional definition uh, that refers to the protection against specific risk of disease or injury through biological or chemical agents. So this has to do with pandemics and with the threat of bioterrorism. In contrast, the second dimension deals with personal services, services that are, are, are delivered to an individual. So it could be called health care security. This was actually the usage introduced by President William Clinton in his reform initiative of 1993, which, for those who were around at the time, was named precisely the Health Security Act. Addressing the Congress, President Clinton, Clinton defined this dimension as follows, and I quote, security means that those who do not have now health care will have it, and for those who have it, it will never be taken away, end of quote. This is security of access. And this is a very key element. I would add that within healthcare security, we should also worry about quality issues, specifically safety from iatrogenic harm, effectiveness, and very importantly, responsiveness that safeguards the dignity of patients. The third and final dimension is financial security, which refers to protection against the economic consequences of disease especially against the risk of catastrophic expenditures as a result of paying for care. The risk of going broke for getting sick is a huge challenge worldwide. WHO estimates that every year about 100 million families experience catastrophic or expenditures uh, or, or impoverishing health expenditures. It is worth mentioning that these three dimensions of health security are consistent with the guiding principles of the healthcare reform initiative that is currently being hotly debated in the United States. These principles include, first, protecting families from bankruptcy or debt because of healthcare costs, 
This is financial security. Second, improving patient safety and quality of care. This is healthcare security. And third, investing in prevention and wellness, which of course has a direct relationship to the public health measures that can protect the population from epidemics. The topic of security becomes particularly relevant given the critical situation that the world is going through right now. As I said before, we're in the midst of a unique coincidence of events. The best chance for health reforms since the New Deal. The worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. And the appearance of a pandemic that conjures images of what has been called the Great Influenza of 1918. All of these events have these grand sounding names. The, 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 the New Deal, the Great Depression, the Great Influenza. One could think that such an explosive mixture would make this the worst possible time to attempt something as ambitious as healthcare reform in the United States. But history shows us that many of the most enlightened social protection measures have been enacted precisely at times of economic or political crisis, as exemplified by the New Deal in the United States or the, national, the birth of the National Health Service in Great Britain. In fact, if well-crafted, health reform can be a key ingredient of economic recovery. A major part of the rationale for fixing the US health system has been precisely to prevent this, which is the major cause of business and family bankrupts in this country. And indeed, a major uh, rationale for health reform right now is to restore the competitive capacity of the American economy, which is hurt by the very inefficient healthcare system currently prevailing. The experience of my own country, Mexico, underscores this point. The financial meltdown of 1995 in Mexico created the, condition for excess, the conditions for excess mortality among children and the elderly, as well as for huge increases in catastrophic expenditures among the poor. Partly in response to such evidence, Mexico introduced three major policy innovations. First, conditional cash transfers that create incentives for poor families to invest in the human capital of their children through education, healthcare, and nutrition. Second, universal health insurance through a new public and voluntary scheme to provide access for 50 million previously uninsured persons. And third, the creation of a new public health agency charged with protection, pr protecting the population against major health risks. Among other measures, such innovations may explain why the economic crisis was short-lived, and most importantly, why the three dimensions of health security have improved so much in Mexico during the past decade. A key lesson from the Mexican experience refers to the constructive role that rigorous evaluation can play in promoting, promoting enlightened social transformation. Whenever a country embarks on large-scale reform of its health system, Periodic evaluations become a key stewardship instrument to ensure that the initial objectives are being made and that mid-course corrections can be carried out in a timely and effective manner. But to be valid and useful, such evaluations cannot be an afterthought that is introduced once the reform, once the reform is underway and maybe things are not entirely working out as planned. Instead, scientifically designed evaluations must be an integral part of the design of the reform itself. For instance, the recent Mexican health reform adopted from the outset an explicit evaluation framework that included a randomized trial, trial, a randomized trial to compare communities introducing insurance in the first phase and match communities sketch, scheduled for later adoption of that plan. The, in fact, this uh, piece of work was carried out and led, the design was led by a group of researchers uh, from Harvard University, uh, including Professor Gary King. The external evaluation was coupled with some internal monitoring to learn as the reform was implemented. In addition to its technical value, explicit assessments of reform efforts contribute to transparency and accountability. They can also boost popular support for reform initiatives that inevitably stir up fear of the unknown in the polarized political climate that has surrounded the current debate in the US, the prospect of periodic evaluations may help counter many objections by offering a transparent and timely way of dealing with unintended effects of the reform. This may just be the last necessary ingredients 
to finally realize healthcare reform in the United States. Reform in the midst of a storm, it's not only a nice rhyme, it also summarizes what I believe is the current challenge. But there is a clear guiding light to help the United States navigate the treacherous waters of health reform in the midst of pandemic and economic storms. This is the principle that guaranteeing health security becomes even more urgent in times of upheaval. Let us not forget that economic shocks are often short term, but health shocks inevitably leave enduring scars. What, it, what is at stake though is more than economics. It is also our entire ethical perspective for our globalized world. Indeed, our concern for, for global security must be grounded on a renewed ethic, the ethic of human rights, so that every human being may have the same opportunity to achieve his or her full, her full potential, as stated by the Commission on Human Security. The concept of health security brings together a human rights perspective with the imperative of human development. Through this comprehensive concept of security, improved health can, help, uh, can contribute to the stability and prosperity of nations, which in turn nourish our global freedom from harm. Health may contribute to this pursuit because it involves those domains that unite all human beings. It is there in birth, in sickness, in recovery, and ultimately in death that we can all find our common humanity. In our turbulent world, health remains one of the few truly universal aspirations. We can make health a powerful force for diplomacy because it offers a concrete opportunity to reconcile national self-interest with international mutual interest. More today than ever, health is a bridge to peace, a common ground, a source of shared security, a way to give globalization a human face. The initial control of the influenza pandemic bought us time to tune up national and global surveillance systems, design risk communication campaigns, rebuild strategic reserves, and strengthen healthcare units. This is also the time to enact the structural reforms that will assure the long-term sustainability of the American health system, and in doing so, generate greater economic prosperity and enhance global security. In the words of President Obama, this is a future, a future we should not fear, but with the help of scientific knowledge, work together to shape. As we engage in this process, we would do well to remember the words of a great American, a universal person, and another winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, Dr. Martin Luther King, who wrote almost 40 years ago, and I quote, it really boils down to this, that all life is interrelated. We are all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied into a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly, end of quote. This phrase, to my mind, captures the essence of interdependence and solidarity that makes health such a key component of development, security, democracy, and human rights. So let us continue to weave together the destiny of better health for every person in this country and indeed in every corner of our interrelated world. Our generation has no task more urgent or important than to achieve comprehensive health security for all. Thank you very much. As is the case in all of the forums held in this space, uh, the dean has agreed to take questions now at this time. A good question at the Kennedy School uh, has uh, three points. Well, actually, it has three parts. First, uh, it has one point. Secondly, it is short. And thirdly, it ends in a question mark. If you would identify yourself and your affiliation at the time of your question, that would be appreciated as well. We'll take our first question okay. over here. My, my name is Jack Sewell. I'm a professor emeritus from San Diego. How would you critically evaluate uh, the worldwide response to the swine flu 
I know that uh, tourism in Mexico got hammered very badly. Uh, was that unjust? So the pigs were slaughtered in Cairo. This was sort of a dress rehearsal. How did we do? Um, I think there are bright and not so bright spots. The, um, some countries uh, did take advantage of the uh, health emergency either to settle some internal uh, issues like the slaughtering of swines in, in Egypt, which of course is a completely useless measure, but had some local resonance with, with uh, uh, local internal politics, or uh, erecting barriers to commerce or to, or to travel. Um, I think the worst abuses were the responsibility of countries who refused to follow the guidance and the coordinating role of the World Health Organization. But countries that did, you know, did comply with something known as international health regulations actually, I think, uh, did a, a fairly good job of responding. And I, I would say that Mexico did that um, because it, um, I mean, when one considers the complexity of dealing with something with the first event, the first instance of a new event, identifying the anomaly of a few deaths against the backdrop of what was still the seasonal flu, the, the regular f uh, flu season, realizing there was something different, and then rapidly alerting the rest of the world, um, I think that was exactly the behavior. But you raise a very important question. I mean, the Mexican economy ha had a, a tremendous hit. And we need, I think, there's a piece missing in the global architecture for health security. And that is to remove the disincentives for timely uh, reporting of health threats. Uh, Mexico is a middle-income country. It's the 12th largest economy of the world. It's a fairly resilient economy, if you will. So the country was able to afford transparency. But many countries can't afford it. Because if the consequence is that then you will, you know, your tourism will collapse, your products will be subject to trade uh, restrictions, your people will be uh, stigmatized and not allowed to move freely, uh, then the, the incentives are there not to report and then make, make the world an unsafe place for everybody else. I think we need to create incentives for timely reporting, particularly for developing countries. And that's a, something that's, that's missing. Um, and the, the recent example, uh, the huge economic price paid for you know, acting responsibly should remind us that, that we need uh, to, to correct that deficiency in our current system. Buenas noches, doctor. Um, my name is Ari Cole, and I'm an alumnus of the Kennedy School of Government, class of 2008, and the School of Public Health in New Haven. We'd like to thank you for serving as a fellow physician. I'm a critical care hospitalist physician and public health physician. You, you inspire us, doctor, so thank you so much for your great voice and leadership. My question has to do with the drug trade internationally. Today we were talking with national intelligence fellows and academics and political leaders around the world, talking about Afghanistan insur insurgency is partially fueled by the drug trade. How do you think we as a nation, as government people here in the US and globally, could start to take some of the fuel out of that powerful engine in the form of drug treatment programs, medical treatment programs, decriminalizing per se, to some degree, use of polysubstances, and changing the problem of drug addiction, drug use, and the money, and changing it into a medical and public health treatment program globally. Thank you. I, I, you touch a topic that illustrates uh, why a, a, a global health is so central to all of these other domains, because indeed uh, the question of, of drug abuse has a huge health uh, dimension to it. Uh, we should not forget that the single largest trade in, in drugs is of a drug that's actually a legal drug. It's called tobacco. And uh, the, the tobacco trade is an example of how, in our globalized world, there's an international transfer of health risks. Very often when we talk about global health, there's a common imagery of risks flowing from the global south to the north. You know, people traveling, they are sick, they bring infectious diseases to our borders. That's the way, very often, the discourse around global health is, is framed. 
Uh, so risk flow from south, south to north and solutions flow, flow from north to south. And in point of fact, many risks flow from north to south. Tobacco is a great example. The two largest companies have their headquarters, one in the United States, the other in the United Kingdom. And it represents uh, now the single most important cause of preventable death worldwide. Um, then there are the illegal drugs. Uh, and uh, I, I agree with your point that there is a fundamental public health dimension it has to do mostly with the demand side on, on, on drugs and that um, in this uh, acrimonious debates about the, the, tr the, the global uh, 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 drug uh, trade, uh, one needs to have a comprehensive uh, policy that does include the reduction of demand through preventive and uh, therapeutic interventions in, in, uh, in those countries that have a high demand. Um, so it, it is another example of how health concerns touch on some of the key uh, aspects of our globalized world. Right up here. Hi. Uh, thank you, Dean Frank, for those inspiring words. Um, I am Sheree Ramirez from um, the Harvard Medical School. I'm a PhD student. Um, I was wondering, there seems to be a lot of political consensus about the lack of coverage for undocumented immigrants with health care reform. I'm wondering if um, you can think of any way that covering undocumented individuals could gain political traction. It, it, it is a hugely controversial part of the discussion here. Uh, as we remember during President Obama's uh, speech at the Congress, it was when he was addressing that one topic that you know some member of Congress uh, actually behaved in a very uh, unseemly manner. Um, of course, for countries that have parliamentary systems, that, that's nothing, right? I mean, that was, <laughs> politeness to the extreme, but, but, it, but it just shows what a, what a sensitive issue it is. Um, look, uh, you cannot say, you cannot say that health is a human right, and then in the same or in the next sentence say that you'll restrict, restrict access on the basis of the legal uh, or migratory condition of a person. There's a fundamental contradiction. If you believe that it is a human right, it means it's a right that emanates from the human condition and it cannot be uh, subordinate to requirements of uh, residency or legality or whatever. Uh, so from an ethical point of view, I, uh, I, I believe that uh, if, you, uh, if you accept the notion that uh, access to healthcare is neither a privilege nor a merchandise, but a right, then uh, you need to cover everyone. Uh, how do we deal with the political reality uh, that that is a stumbling block? I think there's been a lot of misinformation in, 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 in this country about that particular point, particularly by people who oppose reform. The initial notion, as far as I know, in most of the proposals that I have uh, looked into, uh, referred to restricting the public subsidy implicit in the reform effort. And, and, and that is a different thing than, say, than, than saying you cannot have health care. Uh, saying that to benefit from a public subsidy, you need to demonstrate legal residence in a country is a much more uh, acceptable statement. And that's what most of the major proposals have, uh, pro have, have put forward. Now, as a result of the misinformation saying that this is a, 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 a reform that will cover illegal immigrants, some of the subsequent proposals have actually removed any, any kind of coverage. <clears throat> I think the way to reconcile is to allow people to buy into, uh, and, and, and into uh, a, a health plan, irrespective of their legal condition. But, uh, and, and then, you know, you're not talking about using taxpayers' money to subsidize that, but you're also not restricting the potential for access. Uh, that seems to me that could be a solution. But the more fundamental question is, um, how do we think about health care? And that's the big debate. I mean, every country that has gone through large-scale so, uh, health reform has answered that question. Is health part of the general reward system, or is it a condition so that the reward system is considered fair? Is it like buying a car, or is it like primary education, which we consider a fundamental element of equal opportunity? 
and which then makes everything else fair, the, the distribution of all other rewards fair. I think that except for hypochondriacs, there's no inherent satisfaction from consuming healthcare. Healthcare is a means to develop the capacities, the potential of human beings. And therefore, we need to see it as a condition, not as a part of the reward system. And when you do that, then you have to think of it as a right. Uh, that was a discussion that I had seen absent, and exactly in that same speech, President Obama, in that very dramatic moment of his speech, when he quotes from a posthumous letter from Senator Kennedy, explicitly says, this is a right. And I think that was a huge step forward in moving uh, the, the reform process into what has to be a, a debate on the nature itself of, of healthcare. Hello, my name is Lorenza de Casa, and I'm a Kennedy School student here. Um, and my question is that uh, it's very important, uh, one of the incentives there is to insert into the formal sector is uh, having access to health care. And um, in Mexico, as you know, we have like a big uh, concern for the, the size of the informal economy. And also, there was a scheme introduced a few years ago to provide uh, medical health care insurance to marginalized groups, and that, that way they could have the security. But it also um, secured the informal sector. So uh, I wanted to ask you, like, what are your thoughts in not providing, like, providing enough incentives also uh, for the informal sector to, to insert into the formal sector, but at the same time, uh, providing the security. What are your thoughts and how do you can re reconcile this? Uh, thank you. It's, it, it's a question that's very much related to the previous one. In this case, it's not whether you are illegal in a country, but whether you have a, you know, a formal job, which has you know, some, because, uh, some legal dimension because very often the informal sector is defined by people who don't pay taxes, for example. Um, but in the case of Mexico, it's also the poorest people. Uh, this was a very important part of the public debate around the uh, reform that I uh, proposed and finally got, convinced the Congress to uh, approve. Uh, there were many very orthodox economists who opposed the reform. The reform would extend insurance to uninsured people. The situation in Mexico was not unlike the one the United States is living. And basically, the, the fundamental problem was that access to insurance was uh, mediated by occupational status, by position in the labor market. Namely, that you got insurance by virtue of having a salaried employment. And then the, the difference between the US and Mexico is in the US it's private insurance, and in Mexico it's social insurance. But the fundamental problem was the same. You, you, uh, access to insurance was mediated by salaried employment. Um, the reform that I helped to promote and the new scheme, which was a, you know, what now is being called a public plan, well, that's what we did in Mexico, we created a public plan. Uh, what it did is it broke that dependence between formal salaried employment and access to health insurance. And I think that's what the United States has to do, to break that dependence. Um, some people, and I mean, and there were some powerful people, the head of the social insurance program, which covered the formal workers, and of course, he didn't like the competition <laughs> that would emanate. And the, pres the governor of the central bank, um, they both expressed exactly that point. You're creating an incentive for, for, for informality. I counter that with two arguments. First of all, these are not uh, the informal, uh, this is not the informal sector. There's many people who are not salaried but are not informal. And in the case of Mexico, the main group of that, uh, in, in that category were the peasants. I mean, people who own their own piece of land. They're extremely poor. They work very hard. They receive credit. They're, 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 there's nothing informal about their work. They just don't have an employer, and therefore they're not insured. So it's a mistake to confuse non-salaried employment, uh, non-salaried work with informality. And the second is that even for those that are informal, uh, there's no ethical reasoning that can persuade someone that matters of life and death have to be legitimized by position in the labor market. I mean, the fundamental issue that sets healthcare a little bit apart is that most episodes of disease are not the person's fault. A child with leukemia, which is now not just treatable but curable in close to 90% of the cases, 
It's not his or her fault to have leukemia. How do you, how do you provide an ethical framework that allows you to say that if the parents of that child have a salary job, the child gets care and saves his or her life, but if they work, if the parents work by their own, the child doesn't have access to treatment. I mean, how, how do you verbalize a society where that happens? Well, that's exactly the society we would have if we make health, access to health, a part of the incentive system for people either to pay taxes or... I mean, those are separate domains. I, I don't think we can continue to subordinate access to health to position in the labor market. Uh, and uh, I, I don't think it's ethically defensible. I don't think it's politically smart. And I don't think it makes any sense from an economic point of view. Because in fact, I would put that argument upside down. I would say provide health insurance and people will be more likely to be formal rather than the other way around. Right here. Okay, um, my name is Ramon Sanchez. I'm a doctoral student at the Harvard School of Public Health. And my question is, when you were in Mexico, you were, you were dealing with three political parties, very different. How do you, did you make them agree on the main points of your health reform plan? Um, well, first, by not being a member of any of the, <laughs> of the parties, that helped a lot because I, I didn't have any issue of, uh, I mean, people knew I didn't have a political agenda. It's, it's good to uh, reserve some places in every cabinet for uh, technocrats like me and not um, pro professional politicians. But uh, no, I, I do think, uh, I, you know, I, I, I was very much inspired by the work of one of my colleagues at the uh, Harvard School of Public Health, um, uh, uh, Michael Reich, who is a political scientist, who says that public policy is uh, grounded on three pillars, a technical pillar, an ethical pillar, and a political pillar. And I had that very, very, very much in my uh, mindset. Uh, the technical pillar is, of course, arguing with, with good evidence. And you know, evidence-based policy becomes very, very important. The ethical pillar is you know, having the discussions we just had, explicit. And if you can bring uh, agreement around the fact that health care should not be seen as a privilege or a merchandise or a part of the reward system, but as a right, then I think it changes the, the, the tone. And then that, those two pillars then lead to or facilitate the work of the political pillar. And the three pillars, you know, to follow this architectural metaphor, have to work in harmony to sustain the edifice of reform. Um, so having good evidence, good numbers, is incredibly powerful to build political consensus. What I was saying in my prepared remarks, I think it would go a long way towards reaching agreement if there was an explicit, very explicit point that whatever reform is enacted in the United States, it will be subject to rigorous evaluation. It will, it will reduce the fear of the unknown. Uh, that's, we did that in Mexico. We wrote into the law the requirement and the funding for evaluation from the beginning and a requirement to report on the results of the evaluation every six months to the Congress. And that helped to diffuse a lot of the fear of the unknown. Um, so so a, a sound technical base with good evidence and with good evaluation goes a long way to achieving political consensus. And then having an explicit ethical discussion. Every policy reflects a set of values. If you make them explicit, it can further uh, the political pillar, political in the, in the good sense of the word, and we're here at the Kennedy School of Government, you know, in the sense of uh, reaching consensus around shared social objectives. And if you do a deliberate ethical or explicit ethical deliberation, it can help a, 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 a lot. Uh, so it, it, it was using both very uh, well-grounded evidence and having the sort of discussion with just how do you think about health? Um, I remember a dialogue with some members of Congress where the evidence had shown that in the budget we were allocating twice as much money from federal money uh, to the subsidizing the care of those who were insured, the half of the population that was insured, than the other half, who like here had to go to emergency rooms or didn't have a, a health insurance. Two times as much. So I remember sitting with 
these members of Congress and asking them, you know, so, Mr. Congressman, it was a man, so you believe that the life, the, 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 the value of life is depending on the position of a person in the labor market. No, no, of course, I, I believe every human life is worth the same. I say, well, you know, your allocation decisions reveal a different value set because you're actually allocating $2 or two times more money per person to deal with one half of the population with the only distinction of their position in the labor market. And if you're devoting more money for health, that means you value life differentially. And, you know, <laughs> the fellow was shocked and he proceeded to support the reform. My name is Madeleine de Smet and I come from uh, the European Commission where I am responsible for the health data for health policies. And I've listened with great interest to your presentation in particular uh, also to what you told us about your experience in Mexico. And I would like to ask you a question on two issues out of that experience. The first one was that you mentioned uh, education in health and health prevention and health promotion as an important issue. And the second one was that you, and you came back on it now recently, about the evidence, uh, but also the monitoring afterwards, once we have a system in place. My question is, on these two points, what is your opinion, have these received sufficient attention in the whole debate on the healthcare reform? Thank you, it's, a, it's an excellent question. One of the observations I, I made uh, is that in, in, in many insurance reforms, the whole uh, world of prevention and sort of upstream interventions that stop people from getting sick in the first place gets lost. Um, I, I, I've been studying health systems for 25 years and I've seen cases of very elegantly de designed uh, insurance reforms, but where a year later the immunization rate has, has dropped. And you know, there was a, one case that I, that I found um, like that. So we must have a, a comprehensive health reform that also includes the preventive aspects. In the case of uh, the Mexican reform, actually, as part of the overall financial design of the new system, there was for the first time uh, a separate protected fund, was called the Fund for Community Health Services, which included a lot of the, of the public goods that are very much a central part of a health system, all the surveillance mechanisms. This, this is a public good in the classical definition of, 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 of the term. Um, a, a lot of the health education and, and health promotion activities. The, the, and that was the first time that that was protected. And the idea was exactly that because health uh, re insurance usually drives costs up because you remove a barrier to demand, that you would not uh, fund the increased access to health care for curative services by reallocating money from prevention. So it protected those investments. I'm actually very um, uh, positively impressed by the fact that the several principles that um, President Obama spelled out, and of which I quoted three, one of them is exactly to invest in uh, health prevention and uh, uh, disease prevention and health promotion. And I think that's the, the, the right way to, to do it. I mean, to, to actually have that be a comprehensive part. So not just insurance reform, it's truly health reform. And, and that's when it pays back, you know, when you do have a system that can detect something like uh, uh, an H1N1 pandemic in time, and it will have all the downstream benefits of less um, cases to deal with. Good evening, Dr. Fink. Uh, my name is Amy Beeson. I'm a senior at the college. Um, I was in Peru in June during their flu season, um, and there were sort of a lot of highly visible, very expensive measures in place uh, to address the threat of H1N1. Um, and there was some consternation about this because um, of you know, all of the money that was clearly going toward the pandemic security when uh, there's a much larger burden of disease, things like malnutrition and um, you know, pneumonia in the countryside. Do you think that there's a danger in some countries that pandemic security and that reallocation of resources uh, will detract from other national health priorities? 
Uh, it's another excellent question. I mean, you know, if you look around the world, the, the problem in, in developing countries is that we're now facing a triple, triple challenge to health, triple burden of ill health. First, there's still a huge unfinished agenda, a backlog of health problems that should not be happening anymore. If that's from common infectious diseases, from malnutrition, maternal deaths. Maternal mortality is the single most inequitably distributed health indicator. Half a million deaths of women who die giving birth. And 99% of those happen in developing countries. So you have that unfinished agenda of a lot of causes of, of, of death and disability and disease that we already know how to deal with. Then without having finished that, most developing countries, certainly Peru, are now facing a, a growing burden from non-communicable diseases, from the challenges that used to be reserved to rich countries. Diabetes, obesity, heart disease, cancer, mental disorders. And then on top of that, now you add a third burden, which are problems linked with, with globalization that affect countries at all levels of economic development, among them pandemics or the health consequences of climate change. Um, the stress on health systems is huge. And when you look at the way those health systems are financed, it turns out that you know, most health systems in developing countries are underfunded. <clears throat> so my hope is that crises like the pandemic just draw attention from uh, political leaders that we, we, we simply, there's no way around investing in, in, in health systems. When we started the reform in Mexico, Mexico was spending 5.6% of its GDP on health. Completely insufficient to deal with this. This is a very different situation than the United States, where, you know, currently with 17%, the worry is how to, to at least slow down the rate of growth in health expenditures. But most of the world has the opposite problem. You know, we simply don't spend enough. And it's not just a matter of getting more money for health, but also more health for the money, getting more efficient and more responsive health systems. But that, that, that has to be the response. We shouldn't look at this as a fixed um, uh, budget. And you know, on another occasion, I can tell you how we managed to build into the law a, a, a growth of one full percentage point of GB, GDP over seven years uh, through this reform in a way in which we were sort of establishing a new social contract where we would get more money for health but guarantee more health for the money through the design of the reform itself. So I would hope that far from detracting from other pressing needs, as, as you very well express it, this would be a way of raising the visibility of, of health matters and therefore the allocation of resources. Hi, Dean Frank. Thanks so much for coming tonight. It's good to see you again. My name is Jillian Irwin. I'm a junior in the college. I want to ask you about how important you think it is that um, how important you think access to generic medications is to promoting health security in low and middle income countries? It's very important. Um, I think uh, generics, I mean, generics do have a much lower cost structure. The key uh, in developing countries is to assure quality. I mean, that, that's been a, a main barrier. And uh, to create a framework of legal certainty where you don't um, uh, stifle the incentive for innovation that intellectual property rights re represents. So achieving a balance where you protect intellectual property and therefore the incentives to continue innovating, but at the same time uh, then foster high quality generics once patents expire. I think that's the, the policy question. Not every country has gotten that balance right, but I think the the, the most important contribution of the AIDS pandemic, which is still the largest pandemic in human history, AIDS, was that it actually managed to create a framework for global action, global collective action, that um, uh, in a framework of you know, protection of intellectual property, was able to secure much, much reduced um, prices. And the fact is today there's close to four million people in the poorest parts of the world, mostly sub-Saharan Africa, on antiretroviral treatment. So it can be done. I think that's one of the biggest success stories of public health, of constructive diplomacy, preventive diplomacy, uh, 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 through the use of, of generic drugs, which still manage to preserve the incentives for innovation. I think it can be done. It doesn't have to be a zero-sum game. We have a question. 
time for one more question right there. Wow, that's yeah. what an honor. I am a student in the Department of History of Science. My name is Debbie Lin. And I was wondering, today, tonight you've spoken a great deal about things that are ethically relatively clear, things like health security, the need for transparent reforms, and things of the sort. But um, in the past few years, at the very least, we've seen how there are much murkier issues, such as working with um, parties that are uh, um, that have different incentives or different value systems, such as tobacco companies or perhaps non-democratic governmental entities like China. And in your opinion, what are the sort of guiding principles for a framework of engaging with those different entities? <coughs> well, it's a, it's, a, it, it's a great last question, uh, except that a proper answer to this thoughtful question would require another forum session. But <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to try to, uh, at the risk of trivializing what should be a much deeper discussion, to give you a, a very quick answer. So uh, to end our, our, our meeting today, um, when you look globally, there is something that I have termed the sovereignty paradox. In our world today, we, we have a world polity of sovereign nation states. The nation state is not going away. If anything, the number of nation states has been growing. And in this world, health is still a primary responsibility of sovereign national, nation states. Yet, the control of many of the determinants of health and of the means to improve health are no longer within the control of any single government. You know, look at the pandemic. You know, if, if one country fails to report on time, it affects everybody else. There's huge externalities. So one government cannot control because this is a world policy characterized by sovereign nation states. Or the, global, uh, the health effects of global warming or the, you know, the movement of people uh, across the world uh, with, with all the risks that that entails for, for the transmission of infectious diseases, et cetera. The, 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 so, so this is the sovereignty paradox. How do we deal with that? Um, uh, well, or the, the case you're raising in your, in your question. I mean, governments that are themselves the main perpetrators of human rights violations, or that simply lack the capacity, even if they're democratic, but simply, like in the previous question on Peru, ha lack the capacity to uh, satisfy the health needs of the populations, even if they recognize that this is a right. I don't think the solution is to, um, think that we will institute, I don't know, a sort of uh, global health security mechanism that will go above sovereignty. I think the solution is shared sovereignty, sharing sovereignty. And that's exactly why we have a multilateral system, so that countries can share sovereignty to deal with some of these externalities and some of these determinants that, and, and to mobilize the collective action of nations uh, to deal with some threats that no single country can, f can face by itself. In that shared sovereignty, it seems to me that the framework of human rights offers a rationale for mobilizing international collective action when it comes either to providing some solidarity for countries that lack the capacity to meet the health needs of their countries, or to um, make a case for the need to deal with health concerns in countries where the government itself is a perpetrator of human rights violations. So I think it's the framework of shared, shared sovereignty in, uh, underpinned by the, by the concepts of human rights that allow us to deal with this paradox and mobilize global action for the pursuit of this shared uh, universal aspiration, which is health. Um, it doesn't always work, but it's our best hope uh, when it comes to health matters as a key part of, of, of global security. Thank you. Well, join me, please, in thanking our Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.